as they're listed in the uh, booklet itself, that is uh, Fikro Negash uh, Gebrekidan, who's an associate professor of history at St. Thomas University uh, in Canada. And our uh, second speaker to follow him, uh, my colleague at, at Cornell, uh, Professor Aishan Hutchinson, who is associate professor in the English department and in the graduate writing program at Cornell University, Ithaca, United States. And uh, Professor Nadia Nur Hussain, uh, who is an associate professor in the English and Africana Studies at Johns Hopkins University, uh, Craig School uh, of uh, Arts and Sciences in Baltimore, Maryland, USA. Uh, welcome everyone to this panel. Uh, I just want to mention that the uh, CV of each one there, they're all highly accomplished uh, scholars, uh, known within their field. Uh, and so let me uh, welcome, uh, there are just a few things that I want to mention. I don't know if uh, 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 these are just uh, ground rules uh, in terms of uh, how we're gonna move ahead. Uh, each uh, of the presenters uh, have uh, a limited time, of course, to do the presentation. Uh, once it's finished, each one after the other, we'll open up the discussion. Uh, we want people to really be mindful of time as there is something like a question and answer uh, and discussion too. Um, all the participants now are actually uh, are given the privilege uh, of, of coming in and by participant, I mean everybody who's participating in this conference as a panelist in this panel or any others, they can enter as uh, with the same privilege as panelists to and participate. Uh, all they need is to just unmute themselves and also show their video and enter uh, if they have questions, but at the same time, they can also raise their hands and uh, anybody who's working on, on Zoom uh, is, uh, I think by now got used to the idea of how to uh, raise a question or interfere or interject or, uh, uh, with an argument. So let me uh, start by welcoming Professor Fekir Negash, uh, who will be presenting a paper titled Unmarked Treasure, Du Bois and his 1930 memorandum to the Ethiopian government. So join me in welcoming uh, Professor Fikr Negash Gebrekidan. Um, all right. Uh, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. All right. Thank you. So doc, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Hassan, for that kind introduction. Uh, and uh, thank you to all conference organizers, uh, including, uh, well, especially Dr. Um, uh, El Sabit Waldegurgis for the invitation. Uh, it's a privilege and honor being part of this conference uh, and uh, uh, part of today's panel. The title of my uh, paper uh, uh, is A Marked Treasure uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and his 1930 memorandum uh, to the Ethiopian government. Uh, my paper is what historians would call a primary, so, a primary, a primary source analysis paper. Uh, it is uh, very straightforward, uh, very traditional, uh, uh, narrative, interpretive. And the primary source in question is um, Du Bois's 1930 correspondence with Kentiba uh, Gebrudesta uh, in Malaku Bayan. Um, uh, I, um, well, I, I call the document a treasure uh, because uh, the ideas, suggestions, and recommendations raised in the paper by Du Bois uh, would have quite an impact uh, on the Ethiopian uh, government uh, uh, and the way it grappled with uh, challenges of modernity um, in areas such as uh, international loan, uh, dependency, um, then alignment, uh, white privilege, and of course, the politics of Pan-Africanism. Uh, my paper would take me about 22 or 23 minutes. So if I go over by two or, two or uh, three more you know, uh, minutes uh, over the limit, uh, please, uh, 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 my, uh, my apologies to, uh, to all of you. Um, 
All right. Uh, so in July 1930, a memo from uh, Professor Alain Locke alerted W.E.B. Du Bois, Dean of the Black Intelligentsia and leading, leading civil rights activist, of the upcoming call to his office by two eminent guests. Kentiba Gebrudesta was on his way. To, I'll repeat this, please. Uh, Kentiba Gebrudesta, seasoned Ethiopian statesman, was on his way to the United States to negotiate a bank loan for a dam project on Lake Tana. Construction work was already contracted to J.G. White Engineering of New York City, and the dam was to be built at the mouth of Lake Tana, where the Blue Nile began its long meandering course. Serving as assistant to Desta was Lij Malakubayan, a graduate student at Howard University Medical School. During a stopover in Paris, the Ethiopian South had caught up with Professor Locke, one of Bayan's mentors at Howard University, whose letter of introduction to Du Bois they had solicited. They had solicited. Du Bois could not have been more ecstatic. Recently, there were there, there were rumors of a commission of Abyssinians coming here, which was to visit me, but I have seen nothing of it. He was to confide to a friend even before a fortnight had lapsed since receipt of Locke's dispatch. Mid-August saw the long-awaited moment to come to pass. Come to pass. Twice, Desta and Bayen had called on the boys at 69 Fifth Avenue, the Manhattan headquarters of the NAACP. The boys's follow-up correspondence began with the recognition of what he felt was a historic moment. Gentlemen, I wish to assure you first of my personal gratification at coming for the first time in direct communication with Ethiopia. Enclosed was a rough draft of policy recommendations to the Ethiopian government entitled a memorandum to His Excellency uh, Kentiba Gebru and Mr. Malaku Ibayan. The nine page document opened with highlights of African-American achievements, a rich tradition of, of resistance, ongoing struggle for civil rights, contributions to arts and literature, and vibrant institutions of higher learning and economic life. Summaries of the 1919, 1921, 1924, and 1926 Pan-African Congresses followed, branching into depth analysis of the European domination of the world economy through the manipulation of capital, credit, and patent laws. Regarding international pol politics, tips on tactical alliances were offered such as the need for the anti-colonial forces in Africa and Asia to close ranks with the anti-imperial powers of Germany and the Soviet Union. Then the discussion shifted to bread and butter issues. Ethiopia needed to embrace the gold standard for the sake of a stable currency, the memorandum advised. Along with that, the government had to modernize the national economy, such as by keeping records of income and expenditure, as well as by uh, creating a national banking and credit system. When negotiating with foreign powers, Ethiopian diplomats had to watch out for any sugar-coated costly business dealings. They had to learn from the negative examples of China, Egypt, and Algeria, countries whose national sovereignty was compromised because of the debt trap set by Western financial institutions. Quote, Usually, loans to colored countries are for political effect, with the idea they're not going to be paid, and that eventually the creditor country can foreclose and secure political control, the boys forewarned. Such loans are, of course, highly dangerous, and I hope Ethiopia will not consider them. A modernizing society needed to invest in an elite brain trust in its technocratic class. That was the position Du Bois had consistently promoted in response to Booker T. Washington's gospel of low-level vocational training in black higher education. In the Ethiopian context, this translated into an all-out modernization scheme through the transfer of industrial technology. Until Ethiopian institutions could roll out 
their version of the talented tenth. Uh, they could draw on the untapped reservoir of diaspora resources. The benefit was mutual, according to Du Bois. Like Japan after the Meiji Restoration, Ethiopia would enter into a steady course of rapid industrialization. And for a surplus of African American college graduates and artisans, such overseas projects would provide gainful employment and unique life experience. Quote Ethiopia should immediately seek to attract to her borders a set of young colored engineers trained in modern industrial technique. Du Bois prescribed. She should have aviators to develop airways all over the country. She should have metallurgists, iron and steel makers, chemists, physicists, and electricians trained in every branch of modern technique. Here, it is worth pointing out that Du Bois's vision of mutual self-uplift differed markedly from Marcus Garvey's ideology of racial nationalism. While Du Bois understood that African modernity did not have to reinvent the wheel, he understood a great racial disparity in fields such as finance, manufacturing, and international law. In that case, the Ethiopian government stood much to gain not only from the mobilization of overseas race patriots, but also from the active recruitment of world-class white professionals. Less the familiar history of colonial racism entrenched itself in the process, Du Bois suggested practical checks and balances. First, Euro-American candidates could be carefully screened so that only those with progressive racial views were hired. And second, actual decision-making responsibilities could be shared between such white appointees and their Ethiopian or African-American deputies. Some of the above pronouncements, such as the need to tap, I'm sorry, I'm getting some disruptive emails. Uh, I'm sorry, my apologies. Uh, uh, all right, um, some of the above pronouncements, such as the need to tap into diaspora labor pool, uh, were popular ideas that Ethiopian officials, such as Hakim Urkineshete, uh, aka DR Charles Martin, had entertained since the mid 1920s. Others bore the peculiarly Du Boisian trademark of anti colonial nationalism. In this regard, the memorandum was as much a political manifesto as it was an economic roadmap. For example, Desta, Desta and Bayin were to organize in New York and Washington as many brainstorming sessions as possible before heading back home. Then, according to Du Bois, quote, a fifth Pan-African Congress should be called to meet no later than 1932 at Addis Ababa. And at this Congress, efforts should be made to have leading groups of Africans of the world represented. Uh, remember, he was writing this in 1940, not in the 1960s, uh, but the ideas, are, the ideas are very, very similar, uh, but he, he wrote this in 1930. Uh, Desta and Bayan sailed back to Ethiopia uh, in time for their sovereign's grand coronation ceremony in November 1930 an immediate accomplishment of their overseas mission was the recruiting of two Americans, two white Americans, uh, Everett A. Carlson and Ernest F. Work to fill top level advisory positions in the ministries. Another outcome was much more subtle. Cognizant of Du Bois's advice that international entanglements over Lake Tana could indeed turn into a Trojan horse on national sovereignty. The Desta and Bayan prevailed on their government to silently back out from the loan acquisition scheme. On the other hand, no Pan-African meeting took place in 1932 in Addis Ababa. Although, as we shall see, the vision would inspire the establishment of the organization of African unity in the long term. Neither did Du Bois's alternative loan venture uh, fully pan out. 
uh, his memorandum had suggested that bank loans be sought out only as a last resort and only from countries such as the United States and Germany, countries that posed fewer risks of colonial entanglement. To that end, Du Bois had even offered to liaise between the Ethiopian delegates and the Harlem-based Dunbar National Bank. The Dunbar National Bank was um, a bank that um, uh, catered primarily for African-American clients. Uh, I think it was owned by the uh, Rockefeller family. A delegation from Abyssinia has visited me twice for information and advice. He wrote to the bank requesting a meeting with its president. President Charles Hewitt obliged, but his response arrived too late, perhaps a day or two after Du Bois had already declared the initiative a failure. The more I think of it, the more I'm convinced that nothing can be done with the banks of the United States at present, his message of August 21st to Desta and Bayan lamented. Such immediate setbacks notwithstanding, Du Bois's memorandum would have lasting resonance in Ethiopian politics. In fact, by chance or design, its recommendations would constitute a de facto policy blueprint. Throughout the 1930s, for example, the Ethiopian government maintained an open door policy towards black repatriation. True, because of high political profile, white expatriates enjoyed a much more visible presence in the bureaucracy. Still, as Du Bois had counseled, relatively sympathetic racial sentiments factored in the vetting process of such individuals. Aforementioned Carlson, the man Desta and Bayan hired to spearhead their government's legal department was a case in point. Of the list of candidates submitted to them by the said department, excuse me, um, Desta and Bayan settled on the seasoned public accountant from the state of Maine, distinguished by many years of service to the Caribbean nation of Haiti. Until his death in 1937, Colson would remain Haile Selassie's most trusted advisor, perhaps even the most influential foreigner since the Swiss-born Alfred Elk, Emperor Menelik's famous confidant. So here I'm using um, Colson as, as an example uh, where uh, Desta and Bayan uh, um, uh, used uh, the criteria you know, provided to them by Du Bois to uh, uh, handpick uh, uh, Colson, uh, in part because of his uh, progressive racial views, and in part, uh, and in part because he actually had worked uh, in Haiti uh, for quite a while, uh, and, and then he turned out to be a very successful um, um, employee of the Ethiopian government uh, in the early 1930s. And he was not the only one. Um, likewise, Ernest Work, the other American recruit had mentored Bayin and his two com other compatriots while they were undergraduate students at Muskingum College in Ohio. Once in Ethiopia, Work's name would become synonymous with a major educational reform policy. Ties with African-American academics distinguished Work from most of his contemporaries, and the white professor was erroneously described as Afro-American by a leading North American Ethiopianist, the late Harold G. Marcus. Evident was also Du Bois's signature on fiscal policy. As might be remembered, the 1930 memorandum had suggested the establishment of a national bank as one of the imperatives of a modern economy. In 1931, Haile Selassie liquidated the foreign owned Bank of Abyssinia, considered a factor in the country's worsening financial woes, including the unfavorable balance of trade because of a weakened Maria Theresa Taylor. That is a, that was the Ethiopian currency uh, for those who don't know what the Maria Theresa was. Um, in its place was established the government owned National Bank of Ethiopia. Uh, much of the initial capital having been raised uh, by the emperor himself. Likewise, loan negotiations for the dam construction 
discreetly seized a cautionary measure against potential entanglement with the predatory multinationals. Imperial Ethiopia would continue as a poor but relatively debt-free country into the, uh, into the 1960s, sorry, into uh, the post-war decades. And in 1960, Du Bois would feel vindicated by his own wisdom of some 30 years prior. I have read with great interest in the New York Times the report of your speech at the meeting of independent African nations, his missive to Haile Selassie read. I write to thank you for the speech and especially for its warning to Africa not to become dependent upon loans from Europe and, Amer and America. And of course, he wrote that uh, in 1960, 30 years after the memorandum that uh, uh, I'm talking about here uh, in my paper. Um, in the diplomatic arena too, worth mentioning was Du Bois's advice for the need for making common cause with the secondary powers in Europe and Asia as a returns to global imperialism. In 1931, Ethiopian Foreign Minister Harry Walder Selassie visited Japan, an event that did not pass unnoticed in the, unnoticed in the influential papers of Europe and North America. Relationships with Germany remained stable, not only in the days of the Weimar Republic, but also through the early years of the Third Reich. This de facto policy of non-alignment would continue into the Cold War decades, during which Haile Selassie commanded as many fans behind the Iron Curtain as he did in the Western capitals. Finally, the memorandum represented a unique chapter in transoceanic race relations. Scores of working class African Americans, including aviation extraordinaire John C. Robinson, the Brown Condor, migrated to East Africa in the early 1930s. Serving as godfather to whom the pioneers turned for help was the now familiar Gabriel Desta, one of whose own sons lived and worked with a, with a team of African American land surveyors uh, near. Lake Tana. Few could have seen the tragic turn of events that was soon to unfold, however, and most of the newcomers would scurry back to the United States on the eve of the Italian invasion, bringing the earnest back to Africa experiment to an unfortunate and premature conclusion. In the United States, Du Bois would continue corresponding with Malaku Bayan. 30 years his junior. Bayin, who only a year later broke his engagement to the daughter of a government minister to marry, uh, in order to marry an African-American schoolmate, Dorothy Hadley of Evanston, Illinois, would prove to be a uniquely gifted Pan-African interlocutor. Italy's invasion of Ethiopia in 1935 forced Bayin, despite his training as a medical doctor, into a life of activism as anti-fascist crusader, fundraiser, and newspaper editor. His sudden death in 1940 would leave a gap in Ethiopian-African-American relations that no future kindred spirit was able to fill. He was, he was an ambassador of Pan-Africanism in a singularly happy sense, Du Bois eulogized, adding, then came war, conquest, and disaster. He struggled bravely and died in his 40th year from what men call pneumonia and angels know as a broken heart. That was uh, Du Bois's eulogy to uh, uh, Malaku Bayan. Conclusion. Traumatized and inward looking, Ethiopian intellectuals who survived the Italian Holocaust were not as tickled by the broader view, by the broader worldview of Desha and Bayin. Ethiopian Pan-Africanism would have to simmer on the back burner for another couple of decades, at least until the early 1960s. Post-war Du Bois, on the other hand, would play an active role in campaigning for Eritrea's return to Ethiopia through newspaper columns and public lectures. It was a conviction he had expressed in the 1930 memorandum. It should, of course, be a fixed object of Ethiopian diplomacy to obtain an ocean port, 
the use of free port like Masawa or Djibouti, but eventually a port that Ethiopia absolutely owns, he had argued. At the founding conference of the United Nations in San Francisco in May 1945, Dubois confabbed briefly with Ethiopia's most senior officials, whom he generously dubbed a delegation of intelligence and insight. Another encounter followed three years later at the Ethiopian legation in Washington, DC, and during which the retiring NAACP leader expressed his hope for a Pan-African gathering on independent African soil. Du Bois's last wish would become real 15 years later and no less during a critical juncture in African political history. At the wee hours of May 25th, 1963, the All Africa Summit in Ethiopia concluded with the signing of the founding charter of the OAU of the Organization of African Unity, a feat few had then thought was possible. Du Bois was too frail to leave his newly found abode in Accra, Ghana, but his wife was in Addis Ababa witnessing in person the historic occasion. Shirley Graham Du Bois, who flew in with the Guinean government delegation, considered the creation of the OAU uh, as a major milestone, describing it in superlatives as probably the most important gathering so far in the century. She was not wrong. When seen from the perspective of her husband, the founding of the OAU was more than a grand moment in African history. It represented the fulfillment of a lifelong vision, which Du Bois had spelled out, uh, had spelled out in the 1930 memorandum, a document whose profound impact on the Ethiopian government is gradually becoming clear. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Fiko, for a very enlightening paper. And I'm sure we will, there will have, people have a lot of questions. That's actually will be also a continuation from yesterday as some of these issues have been tackled. Uh, but it's interesting what you brought in as a focus uh, exactly on the uh, Du Bois uh, memorandum. So uh, join me in welcoming uh, Professor Aishan Hutchinson, uh, who will deliver a paper titled Running to Paradise is a personal narrative of a journey to La Libella, Ethiopia. Aishan? Hello. Hi. Good evening and good morning and good everything. I suppose we're all tuning in from all parts of the world. Uh, thank you, Salah, for the introduction. And thank you, Fikru, for your presentation. That was really engrossing. And I'm looking forward to hearing you, Nadia. I deeply enjoyed your, your book. And so I can't wait to hear from you. Um, so in the beginning, Salah said that uh, we're all scholars and that's a lie because I am not a scholar. And um, but as he said just now, this is the, the thing I'm going to present is a very personal narrative of a visit to Lalibela. Um, I'm a poet and this is the, way that I can sort of feel my way through thinking through a, a, a very complex um, psychological, historical, psychic um, uh, fragmentation. So uh, the piece is sort of gesturing towards thinking through such uh, complexity. Um, run into paradise. In December of 2015, I traveled to Ethiopia for two weeks. The visit, my first time, was like a return. Even more emphatically, it was like a homecoming for me, though I have no ancestral claim to Ethiopia. I was in Addis Ababa most of my time. There, the feeling of homecoming was essentially communal and celebratory, full of the elation of encountering the city and its people. But on an overnight visit to Lalibela, I experienced homecoming as much as the shock of recognition as of illumination. I'm going to read the latter passage of an account about that journey to Lalibela. It concentrates on the moment of entering into the magnificent Be Georgis, 
the last in the complex of Lalibela's 11 rock churches. And if time permits, I'll read a small portion following that moment. But instead of referring to earlier parts of the narrative to, talk, to contextualize the passage I'll be reading, I'm going to begin by reading something which came 12 years before that journey. It is a poem I wrote in 2003 when I was a first year university student in Kingston, Jamaica. When I wrote this poem, I never anticipated I would ever uh, arrive to Ethiopia, even though my entire life up to that point, you could say without exaggeration, was a preparation for that arrival and the special feeling of homecoming I felt when I did arrive there 12 years later. Homecoming, like poetry, is an intense kind of belatedness. In the Caribbean, we all live with this condition. Belatedness, a term of 17th century origin, which means overtaken by darkness, is something that can only be imagined out of. The whole experience of the Caribbean since the colonial period has been about imagining the self or the nation out of the state of being overtaken by darkness. I was raised in a Rastafarian family and among people I grew up with, Ethiopia fulfilled this redemptive imagining as both the present and future counter to our tragic slave past. Indirectly, an aspect of this background or atmosphere infuses the poem I will read. It looks back at an earlier time of childhood, at the landscape of sea and cane, and at other rural remnants of plantation slavery. But it looks back too at a deeper past that is outside of the contemporary life framed by colonial history, a past of an inexplicable Ethiopic presence which fermented in us an idea of paradise, one necessarily conditioned by loss, but at the same time, one that remained whole and made it possible for us to create hymns of gratitude and rebellion. Um, so here's the poem. It is called Nighthawk. I thought I would um, share screen and put it on the, on the, um, for us to see, but I don't know if I have that. Uh, if I if I'm capable of doing that, so um, I won't I won't try to attempt. Can you try to share? Uh, Satan is there also on, online. Yeah. Okay. I, can help you the uh, Should I try? Oh no, I can't. Host disabled participant screen sharing. We drum the stars into nations of goat skin, hollowed oaks. The cowbells struck a procession around the seaside's ring. When the heaves steadied, a drop thunder voice parted our singing. Nighthawks, his staff raised, locks shaken, ember flitted head, red eyed chants. We stay riveted to his bellow, ever torn Old Testament. Every horn, geese, and cave liturgy. All his stone hymns falling until nothing, nothing but his spread hands, two wide arcs of winded cloth. The sea and everything below listened. All the half arrived of the triangular trade. Dead maroons gathered in trees along the ridge, woken by the drowned gong. A colonel lifted his abeng and put out the moon. It could have lasted forever, but a jeep load of Babylon, red striped red coats carrying the veins of old laws prowled around him. He could have been Daniel, Nighthawk, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or the fourth man in the furnace back straightened up, not of this earth, nothing but salt and wind as we loaded our instruments in the truck, potholes rehearsing, the bag, the shack shack, his phrases caught in the gear shift kept changing 
as we stared at the moving bush. Now to that passage from the essay. <clears throat> as Theo, my guide in Lalibela, and I moved on past damp, stunted cairns along the roughly quarter mile trek to Girgis, the sea returned to me. There was no dissonance in this. The sea returns whenever I feel joy in its terrible immensity. When we arrived at the high vista surrounded by juniper and olive trees, where the church plunged like a waterfall down into the earth, the rain stopped. The cross set into the large square roof of the cathedral floated in the light. The inlays of engraved stone rippled. Such light, claritas, after rain light. It was a low grade silver transmuting into amber. The whole landscape was arrested. The waiting light I wanted to call it. The light of ascension as I went down into Beat Gyrgis alone. Theo settling himself in one of the arch alcoves surrounding the church. In that rain swept silence, <clears throat> I marveled at the Rosetta terracotta monument spotted with lichens that resembled bee pollen, Lalibella's essence. The hulking structure embodied the mountain and at the same time emanated another. A silence opened within me, the astonishment at God's infinite power within the stone. Who has sculpted the sea into a place of worship? Imagine an undersea cathedral. Imagine fording to the deep unknown to know the unknown. This was the great triumph of Lalibela, the king of that name rendered with an important shift of proposition what Christ said to Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. It was a superb grammar, the movement of a self in the rock, an experienced Alvarez, the 16th century Portuguese priest and traveler, the first European to describe the magnificence of the churches, never had. His journey, as he tells it, ends in a prodigious anticlimax. About Gyegers, he can only report, the doors are very well worked outside. He then adds tersely, I did not go inside as it was locked. Lalibella himself, never stepped into Beit Girgis. According to tradition, the masterpiece may be the king's memorial constructed by his widow after his death. The great house uniting Lalibela with St. George, Ethiopia's patron saint, was therefore an act of love. Fate moves mountains, love moves mountains to heaven. The doors were wide open when I approached. No one else was in sight or not quite no one. 500 years ago, a pilgrim to Lalibela from Armenia decided he would not return home. He was still there, grayish coral bones and all, preserved in one of the inset walls of the church, his feet pointing towards the doors. The waiting light was there as I climbed a few steps to the doorway. I crossed the threshold into an ancient silence. The interior was mistier, darker than the other churches. Even so, I recognized immediately the aesthetic convention, the mixing of the simple and the elaborate, finding a sublime pitch. The intensity of impression here was strongest and strangest. I felt I was standing in both the depth and the height of Noah's Ark. I was afloat. The rock was standing water. Was I alone inside this preternatural dark, shadows swirling around me? In the corner of the entryway was a heavy, coal black cabinet with twines of bee wax candle and matches. I took and lit a candle, darkness made visible. When I lifted the tapered flame, I saw the luminous ornament of a tall central altar enclosed by brilliant red and blue curtains. Because I could not see where the curtains hung from above, they seemed without beginning flowing down from space. There were paintings of Christ similar in theme to those in the other churches, though brighter, it seems to me. Then my eyes caught a painting of stunning beauty and horror, such that I had never seen in the other churches. 
It was a portrait of St. George slaying the dragon. And in an instant, it consummated the splendor of the building. The saint sits on his white horse, a red gold hem cape glimmering over his shoulder. His left hand gently reins the horse and in his raised right hand, he holds the spear still thrust through the dragon's throat. A figure partially obscured by drapery, I could make out only a fold of his blue violet tunic, lassos the dragon by the neck. The dragon's mouth is a V spitting out a glowing tongue. I advance closer with the flame, a votive offering. Something came alive, a priest lying down in a corner on the scarlet carpeted steps, rose up. The candle flame ringed his eyes and caught the golden cross he held in his hand. I looked to the painting, half expecting to see the horse without a rider or the mysterious tunic gone. Reflexively, I prostrated myself before the priest. He brought his cross down on my forehead with a subtle force and called my mind to another fire, the Nyabingi nights on shore in Jamaica. I was a boy chanting, Ethiopia, 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 to thunderous drums. I was a little child and my memories of those times are now partly fabled. Certain faces in the crowd remain clear. Nighthawks came clear to me now. His matted Leona lent dreads dusted with sand and his voice tremendous when he bellowed, Ja Rastafari. I was not too young to understand that we were sufferers who had found it possible to see the future. I somehow knew Nighthawk was trying psychic deliverance. Hours must have passed. It seemed centuries did in the pulse and the flash of the flame. The priest lay back down again, motionless and mythical. And I, anointed with tears that shone in the fire, continued on, but I could not bear to see any more. Outside in the twilight air, that was cool, fresh as if it were the first morning of creation. Theo was waiting. We headed back to my hotel about an hour's walk on foot. He allowed me to be with my thoughts. I sense he knew the priest had consecrated the welcome he himself had given me at the beginning of the journey. And for the rest of my visit, as if to honor that, Theo stayed mainly silent like a spirit by my side. The next morning when he came unexpectedly to wish me farewell over coffee on the veranda of the hotel restaurant, he would again place his hand on my shoulder and said, this is your home. It was a binding together, a prayer. Returning through the half dark village, I saw derelict homes perched near the macadam road, the people shimmering by. I felt like the diver in a poem by Robert Hayden who finds at the bottom of the sea, a sunken ship full of human mementos, garments, instruments, shoes, and must now somehow begin the measured rise. The diver's disconsolate, disconsolate encounter is not mine. Yet the question of what happens to a man after surfacing from such a discovery is mine. In such a discovery, one has come close to what is irredeemable in the world above. The diver yearns to find those people whom he calls the hidden ones, the drowned, those who live in a liminal death, still in transit to some port. No funerary rites, no closure. They are the voices I believe my grandmother heard um, when I was a child. And the horror in that word, somehow, the most appalling word, the most precise word of the post-colonial condition that somehow one must go on. The encounter in Beit Girgis, brief and surprising, fortified my spirit to go on. Th thanks so much, Aisha. Uh, you have been on time, which is good, a, a great plus, but uh, you contradicted your own uh, argument against me that you're not a scholar. Uh, uh, you know, you are a scholar in your own, you've written a lot of also 
things that are not poetry, but anyway, there is a value to poetry too, as Glissot himself would argue that the best philosophy comes through, uh, the best philosophy of theory comes through poetry. So you've done that. Thank uh, you. So I move now uh, to uh, Professor Nadia Nur Hussein, uh, who will uh, present a paper, uh, Martial Ethiopianism in Verse. But before I mention that, I just wanted to refer to the book that I should mention, uh, which is just for the benefit of the whole attendees and participant, the book by Nadia Nur Hussein that, uh, uh, that I should mention is Imperial Ethiopianism and African America. Uh, uh, that's published in 2019 by Princeton University Press. So I thought I mentioned it for the benefit of the audience. I myself look forward to uh, reading it. So uh, Professor Nadia Nur Hussein, you're welcome. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you to the conference organizers for inviting me to participate in this panel today. And um, thank you to those of you in attendance. Um, I'm so honored to be um, on this panel with my co-panelists. Um, I'm a professor of African American literature. That's my specialization. Um, and my remarks today are um, in fact adapted from a chapter of my book. Um, the, the full title is actually Black Land, um, Imperial Ethiopianism and African America is the subtitle. Um, and um, I discuss in this chapter uh, poetry written in Af uh, written by African Americans largely in response to um, Italy's invasion of Ethiopia in the 1930s. Uh, much of it inspired by what I have called martial Ethiopianism. Um, so I'll just begin there. Um, with the claim to the throne that rested upon an alleged direct line of ancestry reaching back to King Solomon, Emperor Haile Selassie was exhibited and lionized as the visible incarnation of the country's antiquity and permanence. To honor a black king, as Wilson Jeremiah Moses and others have argued, proves troublesome from a democratic Pan-African perspective. And yet there is a persistent tension between the desire to celebrate the grandiosity of a historic black empire on the one hand and the commitment to democratic ideals on the other. We see the celebration of pharaohs, for example, in the work of Meta Warwick Fuller um, uh, in her pre-Harlem Renaissance sculpture, Ethiopia Awakening, and later in her protege, Lois Melu Jones's um, painting, Ascent of Ethiopia, with both visual artists conflating Ethiopia and Egypt in order to articulate diaspora through the glorification of royalty. The pomp of Haile Selassie's 1930 coronation was marked by the first of two Time Magazine cover photos of the emperor. And this cover arguably heralded the start of American and especially African-American fascination with the figure. The paradox of Eth imperial Ethiopianism, that is a reverential attitude toward the Ethiopian regal line existing side by side, but at odds with a democratic and collective approach to black solidarity runs throughout African-American literature of the 1930s dealing with Ethiopia. Poets as varied as J. Harvey L. Baxter, Melvin B. Tolson, Langston Hughes, and countless others wrote verse intended as calls to action, encouraging readers to rally in support of the Ethiopian cause. But they often did so through the praising of exemplary regal icons, despite ostensibly fighting for justice and equality. In many cases, these regal icons of the 1930s were depicted in their roles as soldiers. The title of this talk then gestures toward this ideological uh, perspective, a pan-African black nationalist perspective filtered through the bifocal lenses of militarism and imperialism. The collective voices calling for racial solidarity in support of the Ethiopian cause were harnessed, distilled, and expressed by both celebrated and obscure African-American poets into the individualized lyric voice of the Ethiopian imperial military hero. And um, this will be familiar to many of you, but when the headlines announced that uh, Italy had invaded 
Ethiopia in 1935, African Americans called upon historical reserves of sympathy for the nation, reserves drawing from both its ancient symbolism and its modern signification, echoing in this duality the contemporaneous journalistic discourse, and held mass meetings, protests, parades, and boycotts in its support. Viewed not only through the lens of racial solidarity, but also through a familiar ideology of Ethiopianism, Mussolini's attempt to colonize Ethiopia was met with a remarkably unified African-American response. It would be reductive to view aid for Ethiopia as simply altruistic, although it was that. Um, it was also believed to be an act of self-preservation. Giving support and sympathy, Black communities across the United States condemned Italy and demanded action. The speaker of a poem by J. Harvey L. Baxter um, called um, To the Barefoot Lads yearns to fight in Ethiopia, romantically and patriotically comparing the shoeless and underarmed Ethiopian troops to those led by Washington at Valley Forge saying, quote, oh, how I wish that I could be with the barefoot lads across the sea and with some Ross could take my stand to fight or die for the fatherland. The occasional verse written for uh, periodicals during the war often depicted military scenes, immortalizing Ethiopian military heroes in verse. In July, 1937, the crisis published a poem by J. N. Hill uh, titled, An Ethiop in Spain, inspired by a son of Ras Imru uh, fighting in the Spanish Civil War. Although the Ethiopian soldier fights alongside Americans and Europeans, Hill cannot conceive of him as a truly modern equal, viewing him instead through a romantic and atavistic lens. This is a quotation from the poem. Silent man of the past, he seemed heroic through dissolution and forced exile, through faded visions of Adwa, of ancient streets in Addis Ababa, of mountains and muddy roads in Abyssinia, where barefoot men trudged their way through centuries of peace and calmly roamed the hills." Close quote. Not only is the soldier trapped in a nebulous fantasy of the past, he is a literary fiction before he even enters Hill's poem as he is measured against a Shakespearean invention. The poem begins with the declaration that, quote, no jewel shone in this Ethiop's ear. The soldier is voiceless, unable to communicate with his fellow soldiers in Italian, Spanish, French, or English. Not even his Amharic is flexible enough to express the inscrutable depths of the soldier as, quote, language could not match the eloquence of his silence. The exotic prince is not a fellow soldier, but a mute and timeless symbol of what they are fighting for. The Ethiopian language does, however, make its way into Melvin Tolson's The Bard of Addis Ababa, which as uh, John Cullen Grusser points out, quote, evinces an impressive familiarity with Ethiopian history, culture, and geography. Tolson has clearly done his research, integrating esoteric Amharic words into his poem. Discussion of Tolson's manipulations of modernist techniques and strategies particularly the use of scholarly apparatuses reminiscent of T.S. Eliot's foot and notes to the wasteland abound in scholarship about his work. Unlike his Harlem gallery, however, the bard of Addis Ababa is not accompanied by notes. The poem is included in Rendezvous with America, a collection of poems that according to Raymond Nelson's editorial statement to Tolson's Harlem gallery and other poems by Melvin Tolson, are quote, genuinely straightforward. They can and should be read without supplements. Without knowledge of Amharic, however, the poem remains inaccessible. And in fact, I had to ask my father for um, help in translating some parts of the poem since I don't speak Amharic. Um, by integrating Amharic words and concepts into his poem, rather than for instance, Greek or Latin, Tolson dignifies African systems of knowledge granting these references the same authority typically given to classical ones, and in the process obscures the poem for Eurocentric readers. In fact, in Tolson's poem, the Italian soldiers, effectively descended from a Latinate tradition, 
literally pale in comparison to the vitality of the African traditions embodied in the bard of Addis Ababa. In contrast to the dull pedestrian, quote, granite-eyed Italians, the Ethiopian bard has eyes that are, quote, glowing like anthracite. And um, I'm going to quote quite a bit from Tolson's poem here. I hope it'll be clear which parts are, are quotations. Um, carrying with him the lore of 6,000 years, the bard's gravitas is rooted in his timelessness. If he seems immortal, he is also paradoxically eternally dead. Tolson introduces the bard as, quote, cadaverous. But the, large, uh, but the bard's Lazarus-like quality is of course in keeping with uh, the Ethiopianist ideology that prophecies the re revitalization of a dormant Ethiopia. The poem in fact concludes with the Ethiopian soldiers call to those long slumbering descendants as the bard accompanied by a dog walks into the future, quote, a great dog and a gray beard ahead, O bard of Addis Ababa, cry the heroes to wake up the dead, close quote. The dog by the bard's side here is the very dog with which the poem opens, apparently stray and vicious, a foreboding omen of the fight between Italy and Ethiopia. Quote, his growl presaging a menace like a foghorn in a fog, close quote. Along with the hyena and a boa, the dog, quote, rips the jackal with scimitar, tooth and claw. Since the jackal is a symbol of Italy and Mussolini used again later in the poem, the dog comes to represent not just the general harbinger of war, but Ethiopia's role in the war specifically. The destruction of the jackal is Tolson's prophecy that Ethiopia will ultimately triumph over Italy. Not only does the bard's quote, chant of men fleshed in epic, um, close quote, but he holds a unifying and tremendous power in every community through which he travels. A quote, hero of Grasmach and vendor of Hakim and beggar and wag, uh, Grasmach uh, being significantly a military designation. Although he is primarily a quote, blooded Amharic scholar, he is literally an acknowledged legislator whose name is the emblem of justice. Outdoor courts invoke him to sentence man or beast and debtors chained to their masters appeal to the bard for release. In affording this level of authority to another poet, Tolson imagines an active role for the poet in the world as one, for example, who would and could influence the carrying out of justice by inspiring a change of course in the Italo-Ethiopian war just as Baxter hoped to accomplish. Lorenzo Thomas, in fact, claims that the bard's influence as both the bearer, this is a quote from Lorenzo Thomas, as quote, uh, both the bearer of tradition and the people's inspiration is a role that Tolson coveted for himself, close quote. Faced with the injustice of the uh, Italian occupation, the bard embodies a populist heroism as he, quote, chants of the freedoms that keep men free. He serves as a human repository of patriotic and democratic national history and a warrior besides complete with dagger wandering under his forefather's flag as if he is marching under a pennant. As a versifier, he can inspire others to action, particularly military action through the battle cry of his ballads. The, this is a quotation, the battle cry of his ballads, the meters blood spurring case the star reach of his spearing finger. He and his military mission even appear to be sanctioned by God uh, with a halo-like diadem of light. This is a, a longer quotation from the poem. Princes and bishops and scholars pyramid to left and right of the conquering lion of Judah and the diadem of light and the red and gold pavilion glitters with basil and night. The bard appears to have merged with the emperor here, just as the Ethiopian royal family claimed a line of descent that linked them to a Solomonic dynasty, the bard's fight appears to fulfill biblical destiny. He mobilizes the Ethiopian peoples by pointing them toward their religiously determined fate. However, the bard's inspiration relies upon the usual fantasy of universal regalization, which I discuss in my book as one of the features intrinsic 
to imperial Ethiopianism. That is the fantasy in which anyone and everyone can be a historic, historic king or at least descended from one. Uh, the implied tension between inclusivity as a universally available fantasy and exclusivity as a fantasy that necessarily excludes others from similar exaltation is in fact embedded in the Ethiopianist um, ideology. In the Bard's chant, which constitutes um, section two of the poem, he suggests that with the uh, Ethiopian warrior's defeat of the Italians, quote, a ras, a dejasmach, a king, yoho, each father's son shall be, close quote. Crowns are in fact everywhere in this poem. Um, the quote, Palaver house shall crown the kith and kin of man. The bard himself wears a quote, bejeweled corona befitting a Ross or a chamberlain as barbaric splendor crowns him. Even the uh, aforementioned diadem of light uh, may be grouped with these crowns. That Tolson cannot resist the proliferation of crowns here signals the presence of the fantasy of universal regalization at work. The appeal of imperial Ethiopianism extended even to those critical of the emperor, such as Marcus Garvey, whose growing disdain for Selassie's imperiousness was compounded by a personal slight. He was snubbed when he attempted to meet with Selassie in England. In 1937, Garvey published in his own periodical, Black Man, at least two elegies dedicated to Ethiopian military heroes, Ras Nasibu of Ogaden and Ras Desta, um, and both notably praise um, a military strength shaped and informed by imperial culture. For the thoroughly imperial Garvey, the crucial difference between Selassie on the one hand and Nasibu and uh, Desta on the other lies in the latter's military sacrifice, rendering them exemplars of not just imperial Ethiopianism, but martial Ethiopianism. The nature of, the Garvey, of Garvey's veneration um, of Nasibu as a military hero of the Ethiopian resistance is unmistakably monarchic. He begins uh, Ras Nasibu with the line, a king has fallen on the field. While he criticizes Selassie for fleeing to England for being, as he puts it, quote, a great coward who ran away from his country to save his skin and left the millions of his countrymen to struggle through a terrible war, Garvey instead pities Nasibu for his, quote, awful lot of dying in exile. Unlike Selassie, Nasibu is a king who lost his part in building glory with his bricks. Although he refers to Nasibu as a king twice, um, he also implies that he is a model of collective participation, thwarted or snuffed out, who wanted ardently and democratically to do his part. In fact, Garvey reinforces the word part by rhyming it with itself in the poem. Uh, Nasibu was not just defending an existing, existing nation, but building one. So rather than abandoning his nation and willfully separating himself from his people, Nasibu in Garvey's eyes suffers from a longing common to conceptions of diaspora, the desire for return. In fact, Garvey's claim that a king has fallen on the field despite his acknowledgement three lines later that he did not, he died in exile. As Brent Hayes Edwards reminds us, the term diaspora looks to the future as well as the past and contains within it, quote, a dialectical tension between dispersal and return, loss and restoration. Uh, the anticipatory restoration is expressed in Garvey's poem as not just an Ethiopian one, but a Pan-African one. After mourning the loss of Nasibu, Garvey writes, quote, the Negroes of the world shall wait to take their stand against the foe. And when they fight to win their state, they'll make the Italians drink their woe. The weight of the Ethiopian tradition in, Af in African-American literature, uh, sorry, African-American letters, as Wilson Moses calls it, bore down upon the inevitably shaped modern lyric representations um, bore down upon an inevitably shaped modern lyric representations of the nation, uh, infusing those representations with a romanticism that made criticism of the monarchy unwelcome and difficult. In fact, because Ethiopianism historically drew its power from the dignity and grandeur offered by the idea of an ancient black empire. So in fact, because Ethiopianism historically drew its power um, from the dignity and grandeur offered by the idea of an ancient black empire, anti-monarchical views 
could be seen as un undermining the essence of the Ethiopianist perspective upon which the poetry about the war depended. Although criticism of Selassie increased during World War II, particularly during his exile in England, his iconic signification still, bo uh, still bolsters Ethiopianist ide ideologies today. Uh, the celebration of Ethiopian imperial culture, particularly through the figure of martial Ethiopianism, remained a powerful propagandistic tool throughout the um, Italo-Ethiopian War. Because the dramatic events taking place in Ethiopia in the 1930s were filtered for many African-Americans through the country's long and profound symbolism, Ethiopia was uh, simultaneously a topical and deep-rooted subject for Harlem Renaissance poetry. These poems often constituted calls for action, particularly military action, entreating the diaspora to summon a consanguineous uh, sympathy and come to the aid of what was both an ancestral home and the seat of it, an historic uh, black empire. Ethiopia was not uh, any longer as Gibbon dismissively called it forgotten and sleeping and African America dedicated verse to the nation as it fought for its sovereignty on the world stage. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Nadia, for also a great uh, presentation through poetry this time. And I think if I look at the whole session, I find it uh, really complementary to each other and also form an extension of some of the debates that we have uh, in the opening session and, at, and in the keynote speech too. Uh, I think I'm glad that this is now carried in more uh, depth in the three presentations. If I may just sum up, and perhaps in the context of my summaries of the, of the, of the major points, I, I may raise a question or two, and hopefully that will begin our debate. I wouldn't take that much time. Uh, looking at uh, 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 Professor Fikru uh, Gebrekidane's paper, it gave us actually an in-depth look at the memorandum, that rare document, uh, what you call it, unmarked treasure given by Du Bois to the uh, delegation of, of Ethiopians. Uh, it gave us a, a kind of a, an amazing uh, uh, look at, at how Du Bois was thinking, but it's also how African-Americans at the time thinking about uh, 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 you know, Ethiopia specifically. Uh, it's a continuation, of course, of, of, of looking at it from an idealist perspective, but it's also motivated by what we now know as racial solidarity. But in the case of Du Bois specifically, I mean, I think his, his, his own intellectual, uh, 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 you could see his early, for example, perhaps more, more what became later on a more Marxist leaning, uh, he was focusing on development and a critique, an early critique of dependency, which is of course in the mid to, uh, with the decolonization becomes a very important question that you see later on in Fanon and others, the idea of, of, of how, uh, one could, you know, uh, uh, you know, avoid the pitfalls uh, uh, of development and dependency on the West that end up in what we know now as the crisis of the post-colonial uh, state. Uh, there are two thoughts that I have uh, in this, and I don't know if uh, Fikro could reflect on them. One of them is when at that time, of course, when uh, I think by that time, probably Booker T. Washington, his nemesis, uh, must have passed away. But it, uh, the debate towards Africa, or the debate towards the African-American, the, the black subject, both of them saw it in a different way. Uh, although they're more, they are both advocates for civil rights and, and often um, Booker T. Washington, by perspective of today, or even Du Bois was criti criticized more because he really advocated uh, some limited development that, that, uh, that's considered really uh, um, most likely appeasing to, to the white uh, dominant, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, a power at the time that is focusing on vocational education and self-dependency and uplifting, but in a way that is, does not enter into what Du Bois think of as in his book, The Talented Tense, where um, he was really talking about intellect, about contribution to humanities, letters, and so forth as one way of really uplifting uh, the race. I mean, of course, he's not underestimating education, but his view of it is really to think about African Americans and the black subject as full subject, full citizen, and, and calling for that. I wonder if you have any reflection on, on thinking uh, just historically uh, uh, in the present, as one would say, about these earlier two perspectives, uh, considering what we now 
know in terms of uh, what is happening with the post-colonial state in Africa. Uh, it's interesting how it's almost like a deja vu that the last one was his critique of the dam that is built on Lake Tana. Now, I mean, the hottest debate uh, in the continent is the whole issue of the Nile Valley uh, in, along this, this, the country, Sudan, Ethiopia, and Egypt. That whole thing about the new Renaissance dam, given a new name, but of course, it is uh, uh, probably motivated by the same in terms of generating electricity, uh, uh, irrigation, and all of those. I don't know if you have any reflection on those. Aishan presentation in a very poetic way, whether it is as prose or poetry that he used to punctuate his presentation, of course, in and of itself is a piece of art and a, uh, and a great performance, uh, add more complex uh, to what it came to be known as the narratives of return. Uh, for him, he added Ethiopia, um, and while when we think about these narratives of return by diasporic uh, uh, intellectuals, we find the most two uh, examples, and I'm sure there are many one could think of, even from Richard Wright to many people who really spoke about Africa or wrote letters to Krumah and others, but there's idea Harmon, Lose Your Mother, A Journey uh, Along the Atlantic Slave Routes, and then my Angelos uh, works, uh, that is all God's children need traveling shoes and the heart of a woman. Of course, they're intertwined as kind of autobiographical. One is written from what I recall, this is like a long time uh, that uh, I didn't go back to it. It's in forms of letters out of our experience in, in uh, Accra, Ghana. And of course, uh, this narrative of return, return, sometime in, in a way uh, that may be bordered on sarcasm when you think about Henry Louis Gates film about Ghana when he said that African-Americans arrived uh, to Ghana before him, very enthusiastic to being in Africa and embraced by Africans and suddenly throwing their, as he said, uh, metaphorically, I guess, throwing their passport in the Atlantic Ocean. And then he said a few days after that, they came back to look for their passport when they realize that the reality is, is not that they will be welcomed with an open hand and they would be also sort of as different or as different than them. Uh, and I, I would love for you to think about these narratives of return because yours is different coming from the Caribbean through Ethiopia that has a, this long legacy within Ethiopianism, Rastafarianism and so forth. But there's also something interesting, I don't know if that I uh, figure out in your journey uh, uh, is these uh, is the Caribbean Rastafarians who sought uh, a land there and sought to be part of uh, a seeking. So, but from what I know uh, among the contestation is that up till now they were not given the citizenship. Uh, 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 although they have a land at some point that was assigned to them. Uh, I don't know, maybe other people in the audience could think about that because these are some of the realities. Of on the ground, where within the context of the post-colonial state, Ethiopia has been welcoming, but there's also these contradictions of what to do with Rastafarians and their views in the ground as part of uh, Ethiopia today. There is that, there is that group of people. So um, uh, for Nadia, of course, she takes the, the, the paradox, as she called it, of Ethiopianism, uh, from a diasporic perspective, uh, focusing on one genre that is within the, uh, 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 within the literature of uh, that part of the creative aspect of the uh, Black diasporic imagination, which is poetry. And um, with, with yesterday, I don't know if you were at the panel or not, Nadia, but there was all of these uh, discussions about um, the contradiction, which is also you take it here through uh, this, uh, uh, through poetry, uh, that is in one way, there is this idealization of Ethiopia uh, and it is, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the whole genealogy of, of, of the ruling class, uh, uh, of the ruling elites uh, during the Haile Selassie's uh, time and well, before that. Uh, and then the realities on the ground, which is, we've discussed this yesterday, of opposition to his rule and looking at it as, as uh, had its own contradictions of impoverishing Ethiopians as feudal system and the whole uh, opposition to it that um, extend, uh, still extended till today. Although when we really think even among Ethiopians today, there are those who are 
is still uh, longing for the monarchy or looking at it as a, a, in, an, an, in an idealized form. So, but then when I think about what you have paused and why it has this positive aspect, I mean, of course I'm neglecting here to discuss or to focus on what you focus on, which is uh, poetry uh, uh, as a genre, but I wanted to take it a step out of this, which is to think about how African Americans, uh, uh, they, of course, there is no one view of, 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 the, of the continent from Africa. It's, it's hard to generalize. There are those who engage in it from a critical perspective or a pan African perspective, realizing the realities of Africa and the dependency, and they have their own analysis. Uh, but there is also an idealization where you see, even among many uh, of the communities of, of, of um, of solidarity uh, in, in America is an aversion to the idea of, of, uh, of engaging with human rights abuses, uh, with critiquing post-colonial uh, government attitudes. Uh, uh, and for example, in the case of Sudan, Darfur and others, there is a hesitation to engage in that. So you find it in university campuses or in solidarity movement with such movement that fight the post-colonial state and its injustices uh, and discrimination and, and so forth, uh, uh, dominated by white liberals. So African-Americans were not engaged in this, uh, but some of course are engaged and I'm not trying to generalize, I'm just saying many, even like especially officials, like Jesse Jackson and others, uh, uh, when they engage with Africa, they try to engage from a different perspective, which is in support of, but not in critiquing those and, and don't engage in this kind of controversial. Uh, uh, but I wonder also today, and that's the last just question to you, Nadia, if it's something that you think can be answered, feel free, is that what is it, what is, what about poetry today in ten, among African Americans vis-a-vis Africa? It, it would be interesting to look at the, con, like the, the, the contemporary, uh, uh, of course, Aishun, as an example, is a point who is engaged in this, but I think it would be interesting to know what's happening in this field. Does, does it become more in close to the African-American experience or is it still had that horizon of uh, uh, that, that kind of embrace also racial solidarity? I stop here, sorry to take too much time, uh, but uh, uh, feel free if you want to start Fikro or Aishun or Naidu. Hello? Should I call on Fikro? Are you there with us? Fikro, you have to unmute yourself. Somebody put the... Uh, Satan, can you unmute him? Uh, okay, has... I think I'm, I'm okay now. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. All right. So I, I, I think you... Uh, um, uh, uh, there was a question about the present day relevance of the, you know, Du Bois uh, Washington debate uh, to Ethiopia and possibly to uh, um, the whole continent as well. Um, and um, I'm not, you know, I don't have much expertise. I don't have much expertise, um, you know, uh, on that debate. But in brief, what I would like to say really is, it seems, it seems unfortunately, uh, and of course, Du Bois and Washington are the two sides of the same coin, really. I mean, it's just a spectrum, right? Because uh, it's, it's very to, uh, you know, dumb down the debate into, um, you know, protest versus uh, uh, complicity, but obviously it's much, much more complex than that. But I think in general, I would say it seems unfortunately that uh, most African governments have taken the side of uh, Booker T. Washington in the sense that less emphasis on social science education, less emphasis on liberal arts education, and much more emphasis on, uh, I don't know what even to call it, this cottage industries of, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, like, 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 um, like um, uh, of, of the sciences. But then here I'm putting the sciences in, in, like, in quotation. Uh, so by to me, it seems the Du Boisian notion of 
liberal arts education as the engine of society. Um, you know, the talented tenth really uh, has been uh, uh, has uh, uh, has been uh, either ignored or even um, totally uh, defeated, unfortunately. Um, of course, we see that in Ethiopia too, where the government, uh, I don't know, they have a policy of, what do they call it, 70% uh, uh, the sciences and 30% of uh, uh, liberal arts education. And yet, yet most of the challenges that African societies are experiencing today, uh, tribalism, uh, and of course, I love to use the word tribalism here. I don't want to use the word ethnic, ethnicism because that's like, giving it a, a more positive touch. Uh, Ethiopia has, right now has uh, the wicked, the most wicked type of tribalism, and I would love to use that word uh, deliberately. Uh, um, corruption, um, mindfulness, uh, lack of mindfulness, those things would have been better helped with uh, some type of liberal arts training. Uh, obviously, when we talk about transcending differences, uh, and we have differences of all types, either ethnic, uh, uh, class, uh, uh, disability, um, you know, uh, uh, sexual orientation. Those are the type of things that liberal arts education would have uh, done a good job, um, if not fixing, at least, um, um, at least, you know, grappling with them. But unfortunately, they don't do that uh, in Ethiopia and, and, and Africa as a well. whole. Um, so I don't know where I'm heading with this, but what I'm trying to say is uh, really the notion of the talent and tenth, uh, the social science, liberal arts education right now, uh, uh, you know, hasn't, uh, hasn't, hasn't, has not gained, you know, much attention uh, in most African countries. So I'll stop here. Thank you so much, uh, Fikro. Uh, Aishan, you have any comments? Uh, on um, what I have raised is... is... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, Allah. Uh, your um, frisi made me think of uh, so many different things. Of course, uh, the mention of um, um, journey writing uh, by mostly African-Americans on their experience in on the continent, uh, there are many examples. The contemporary ones you just mentioned are, uh, of course, uh, some of the more famous. Um, you know, I, I was interested when I went there, I, of course, the, uh, went on the invite of a friend, uh, Doug Maui. And so with the intention to, to just be there and hoping to be surprised. And um, I was initially initially very taken by what I saw in Lale, in um, Sashamani, uh, the the place where a lot of Caribbean people have um, settled since I, I think since the 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 fifties, late fifties, perhaps. Um, there was a kind of melancholy there that was difficult to to write about because it was too heavy. Uh, and close to the kind of um, you know poverty-stricken um, scenes that I'm familiar with from home, so it it touched a, a kind of a wound for me, and I, and that you know to think that people journeyed here to this space and uh, um, with an hope to for a better life, whatever kind of idealized a better life that might have been, and and you know, and didn't find that. Um, in in Lalibela, the, the kind of way that that space sort of fit more the version of what I heard as a child growing up uh, as to what uh, people desire to find whenever they return to or get to Ethiopia was um, more surprising for me and um, felt as if that something that I wanted to engage. So, um, so that's a minority sort of sprung from there. Um, I know that, of course, there are still lots of uh, Caribbean poets, um, Jamaican poets who write about a sort of idealized Ethiopia. And more and more poets are traveling to the continent, to Ethiopia specifically, and writing with a, 
with that with the sense of of things on the ground, uh, a more stark sense of reality. Um, I have not yet really read anything that um, faces up to say the by by a Caribbean person um, that confronts the kind of reality in Sashamani, for instance. That's a narrative that I'm interested in from a Caribbean perspective. Um, I know there is one book, uh, if I can recall, about Sashamani, but it's by an African American. Um, so it would be interesting to see what kind of a journey narrative might come out of a, a Caribbean person writing about that space. So I, it, you know, I, I don't really have a, an answer for for that question, Salah, but it's um, making me think through um, just my own personal, uh, very cursory um, visit, and which has really meant a lot. Um, you know, obviously because I traveled there with such a um, with that with the kind of background I went there with. So you know, the, the process is still sort of unfolding for me. Even to the point where myself, I have not been able to fully um, transform my experience into 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 poems. That's still um, marinating uh, five years hence. We'll wait. I think the, the process will take time, and maybe you need to go back. Oh, <laughs> that's, yes. a that's the plan. That's the plan. <laughs> N Nadia. Yeah, um, thank you. I, I mean, I, I, I think um, Professor Hutchinson probably is much more familiar with <clears throat> a lot of the contemporary poetry that has been written about Africa. But um, uh, I, from my personal reading, my experience is, is that there's a lot more of the um, <clears throat> kind of travel writing that you mentioned, um, Professor Hassan, about you know, uh, in City Hartman's book and. Uh, uh, and by poets too. I mean, I was thinking about, um, not quite contemporary, but Gwendolyn Brooks has written um, about her travel to, to Africa as well. Um, and uh, so I, I, I don't know, I wonder um, why, you know, there hasn't been as, as much poetry that directly engages with travel to, um, to Ethiopia. Um, and I, I do hope that there will be um, something from Professor Hutchinson on that, um, on his experience. But um, I, especially about Shashimene, I think that that would be um, something that a lot of people would be interested to read. Um, as far as the question about um, uh, the discussion yesterday about uh, Ethiopian exceptionalism and this uh, aversion to critique that you mentioned, uh, Professor Hassan, I think um, there, one of the things I, I kind of um, touch upon in, in my book is that uh, I think there's is something so valuable about um, this model of imperial Ethiopianism that I, I tried to sketch out in the book that um, it makes challenge or critique difficult because it seems to undermine what the whole um, ideology is about. Uh, whether or not that's true, it seems like it's very difficult to kind of, um, uh, you know, gain any sort of um, uh, purchase, you know, uh, when when criticizing, um, uh, you know, um, uh, the elite or the monarchy. Um, it, it's it it feels as if um, at least until um, the 30s, it's there's. In the, in the writing about Ethiopia, there's very little direct critique. So I, I was finding a lot of sort of uh, hints of, of um, either um, internal contradiction about how uh, writers were imagining Ethiopia, but still very little that is um, um, uh, openly uh, criticizing, um, you know, the monarchy. So. Um, I think that does change um, later, and that is part of why I kind of end my book around the 30s. Um, I talk about an experience that Langston Hughes, Langston Hughes had um, when he went to um, Ethiopia in the 60s and um, met with Haile Selassie and, and felt very um, disturbed by um, 
the imperial culture that he was confronted with. Um, and um, I, so I do think you start to um, notice it later, um, but, but yeah, that's, that was my, um, my experience in reading uh, around in literature from the period. Nadia. There is a question by Dag Mawinovshit, if you want to go ahead, Dag. Oh no, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Salah, is oh, uh, sorry. Now, mentioned Lanston Hughes now, and um, I'm curious, uh, um, was he involved in uh, writing the Ethiopian um, anthem, national anthem? Uh, I don't know anything about that. I, did you read that somewhere or? It, I thought I read that from your book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, I, I don't think I talked about that. You wrote a poem for, um, for Haile Selassie um, for the, to celebrate, um, I'm trying to think what anniversary it was. Um, might've been the 25th anniversary of his restoration. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Um, no, the, I, anthem was, the anthem was written by, uh, by, by Ford. Abby Ford. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, by Arnold Ford. Ford. Yes. Arnold Ford. That's the UNIA uh, Ethiopian anthem, yeah. Oh, I see, I see, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, Doug, Doug Maui, what's oh, Yeah, yes, sure, sure. sure. Uh, let's see, can you turn that on? Um, Salah, you, uh, you, let me say all Fukru, Nadia, Aishin, beautiful presentations. Uh, uh, I was initially, when I put myself on cue, I was going to ask, the question that you uh, that Aishin just answered about uh, the counter intuitive move as a Jamaican traveling to Ethiopia, not to write about, deciding not to write about Shashamani, which would be the expected thing and to write about Larivella instead. But mm -hmm. my question has been answered, but since, I'm, uh, since I, I have the occasion now, I'm gonna ask another question to Aishin. Uh, and that is Aishin, so when you came is it the case that you didn't know you were going to write an essay uh, and you are a poet? And what is it that about the experience of going to Lali Bella that chose the form of the essay and not your, you know, your chosen genre uh, mm -hmm. in the genre that you are such a, an exceptional, uh, you know, artist at, which is poetry? Oh, thanks, Doug. Um, and thanks for saying that. Um, I, 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 yes, I didn't think I would do anything. I thought just, oh, can, can, can you guys hear me? Yes. <clears throat> you know, um, of course, the, the essay form gives you more space to explore, um, you know, and to invite uh, research and, and experience uh, uh, together because uh, when I started to, to draft the essay, I realized that I couldn't just count on the actual travel. I had to do work. Um, for instance, I, I discovered uh, or researched the, the, the first writing uh, on the, the churches of Lalibela. You know? uh, but that kind of expository meandering, um, it could work in, in, a, in poetry, but with the essay, because the search, um, the, the width of an essay is horizontal. You can sort of go further and push a, a narrative and create a narrative that is more inclusive to hold both research and, um, and, and experience. So it, it came out that way. I mean, I have, I have uh, in little lyric fragments um, drawn on um, the, the, the trip both to in Addis, the time in Addis and in Lalibela, and also Sashamani. So um, those experiences are starting to show in poems, but they're still um, in the incubation phase. And yeah, I'm, I'm just hoping that hopefully in 20 years, I will have at least two very good poems um, on that. Uh, there is a question. Uh, uh, could I, uh, Saleh, would you, would you mind if I make a comment here, please, as a follow up to what has been said so far? Sure, sure, please go ahead. Yes, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, one is about uh, uh, travel writings. Um, 
uh, I think Dr. Nur Hussein and uh, Dr. Um, Jensen have done a good job speaking uh, from the point of view of uh, uh, of Ethiopia within the context of, uh, I don't know if I would call it romanticized or the idyllic Ethiopia. But there is a name that I would like to drop uh, uh, because I think it's a very, very crucial name and much of the African-American travel right thinks about Ethiopia, even if it doesn't build on what I'm going to say, it at least is a follow-up. And the name that I'm going to drop is uh, Malaku Bayan's wife. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Nur Hussein would know who she is because uh, I, I have seen her name mentioned in her book. That is Dorothy Hadley Bayan. Dorothy did actually write uh, about her experience in Ethiopia. Uh, and those writings could now be found uh, in, at Yale University's uh, special collections. Uh, they're not very extensive, but she has a series of correspondence uh, between herself and her sister who was uh, situated, I think, in Washington DC as well. Uh, so uh, Dorothy writes based on her first hand experience in Ethiopia. Uh, and those writings are actually very sensational. She writes about her experience um, uh, in, in Gibby, uh, the palace. Uh, um, she uh, writes about her experience, uh, uh, like you know, was was like her household experience was was, was just everyday Ethiopians. Uh, but unfortunately, no one has tapped into that. You know, uh, to me, this is an, another um, you know, uh, she is another unmarked uh, treasure. Uh, you know, there are elements of gender, obviously. Uh, uh, she's very comfortable with Ethiopians, with uh, like like class, she seems to have transcended uh, the way she was received in the palace. Uh, to a degree, it actually uh, um, contradicts uh, the, the position taken by uh, Langston Hughes. Uh, uh, Langston Hughes, uh, we know him from the poem he wrote, Sons of Sheba's Race. By the way, that's the poem that I think we're trying to uh, remember earlier. But her experience in Ethiopia is phenomenal. Um, uh, um, by the way, she, uh, she also spoke some Amharic. Uh, Dorothy. She spoke some Amharic. She uh, wrote, um, uh, she was a correspondent for the New York Amsterdam News. Much of the uh, material that the Amsterdam News published about Ethiopia in 1935, early 1960s, was actually based on what Dorothy was sending from Ethiopia. Um, what else? Uh, and then about the Amharic, uh, about the person, about the poet that uh, Dr. Nur Hussein mentioned, uh, I think his name is Tolson, uh, the bird of Addis Ababa. Actually, I, I'm, I'm very fascinated to uh, read that poem as well. Um, but I have a suspicion his Amharic vocabulary might have come from the Amharic lesson that Malak Bayin and his wife were providing through their newspaper, the, vo the Voice of Ethiopia. The Voice of Ethiopia, which began publishing uh, in 1937 and continued to publish until 1941 without any interruption whatsoever. It was a weekly paper. They used to have weekly Amharic lessons. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if Tolson perhaps may have taken those Amharic lessons and used that uh, for his uh, uh, poem, uh, The Bird of Addis Ababa. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Semeni, uh, Ayelo, Asfau, I mean, originally sent an S, no, but uh, you're welcome to just join in and ask a question directly. Uh, my question is for Professor Nadia Nur Hussein. So I was wondering, uh, what, what were they reading about people like Tolson in Garbi uh, about Ethiopia? So, I mean, if you can give us, uh, you know, a bibliography list of a sort. I mean, Professor Fukru just mentioned this very interesting, you know, I mean, newspapers. Uh, published by Malaku Bayan and stuff. But other than that, you know, I mean, a comprehensive scholarly work, something written about Ethiopia uh, in a book form or something. So that, that was what I was uh, Yeah. Thank you I for the presentations, all of you, really. Thank you for, for the question. Um, yeah, I, just to kind of, um, to address also um, what uh, Professor Fikru Gebra -Kadan, Kadan said, I think um, that's, a uh, very uh, interesting possibility that he may have been reading um, uh, Bayan's newspaper. 
and um, or periodical. I think that um, there, what I was going to say before um, he even mentioned that is that the periodical culture, especially African American periodicals, um, were were so well developed at this time. Um, they were extremely popular. I do think that um, uh, just generally that because Ethiopia was in the news so much in the 1930s, um, if you look at a, a sample issue of, you know, Pittsburgh Courier or Baltimore, Baltimore Afro-American or Chicago um, uh, Defender from this time, you'll see the whole issue might be about Ethiopia. I mean, it's just in at particular times when there was um, a lot of, um, um, you know, uh, when during battles and things like that, there would be extensive coverage. So um, the poets were ex extremely well um, educated and informed about what was happening, um, which was one of the, um, the sort of reasons that I wanted to uh, write this book about this, you know, how um, the romantic ideas about Ethiopia that we find, you know, especially in the 19th century start to become much more informed by um, historical and, and current events really that um, writers were becoming very familiar with. So um, in terms of actual um, books and things like that, I, 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 I can't point to anything specific. I'd be curious to know actually, um, you know, you can you often find um, libraries belonging to poets that they'll, you know, you can find a bibliography, but um, I haven't done that research yet to see what exactly Tolson could be reading in terms of books, but um, I know that um, in terms of um, mass media, there's just, there's so much um, about Ethiopia at this time that they would have been familiar with. There is and, and, and don't forget Du Bois because he did write historical materials on Ethiopia. Yes. He was a main resource uh, for the African-American community when it comes to historical stuff. Yes, exactly. There is a, a, a question from, um, I think from Sorafel, which is to Fikro and to Nadia. Uh, would you please, would, sorry, would you please say a few words on Garvey's ambivalent and contradictory position in relation to his response to Italy's invasion of Ethiopia in the 1930s? And what does that tell us about the fissures in, in, on the part of the black diaspora support for Ethiopia? For instance, when we juxtapose uh, Du Bois and Gar. Any um, of you? Okay, uh, would you like to go first, uh, Dr. Nurusen, or? Um, I mean, I'll just say that um, I briefly mentioned that there was a, a snub that could have informed part of Garvey's response to Selassie that um, I read about in the, um, in uh, the Marcus Garvey and UNIA papers edited by, um, Robert Hill, that sort of magisterial collection of, um, of papers. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it, it seems as if it's part of it could have been personal. Um, this sense that um, when he approached Selassie in London that um, he was not received in the way that he um, appreciated. But I think also the, um, the, the, the feeling that Selassie did not um, live up to what he thought um, a black emperor, a black, black leader should be. Um, he, you know, I, I mentioned that he um, uh, believed that he was not, uh, that he was cowardly, that he was not um, taking the sort of stand that um, Garvey would have appreciated. So um, I do think it is complex. I think it's, um, there are a lot of um, contradictions in terms of his, how he, um, uh, viewed Ethiopia's potential and 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 um, its leadership, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll allow um, Dr. Uh, Fikro Geber Kidan to to continue. Thank you. Yeah, and actually, I'll build on the uh, the point you mentioned last, the com the complexity. Uh, Garvey, in general, maintained a very complex, sometimes even antagonistic relationship with uh, uh, the African American intellectual elite, um, and that was very self-evident, uh, you know, in the debate that he and Du Bois had, you know, over um, over many things. Uh, Garvey was more like, he was, I think, uh, 
he was much more comfortable, uh, you know, was 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 you know uh, Booker T. Washington than he was with Du Bois. But in, uh, with regards to Ethiopia, I mean, when he when when Mark, we have to also put it in the context of uh, uh, time. Uh, when Marcus Garvey lived in London, that was in the late 1930s. He was really uh, he was almost like a forgotten figure. Uh, was in the um, you know, uh, within, 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 uh, uh, within the African American pro protest tradition, he wasn't the, the person he was in the 1920s. Uh, so he was very much, uh, uh, you know, a lone ranger, uh, and therefore it was easy for him, I think, to feel snubbed, as uh, Dr. Nurusen said, uh, uh, and feel disgruntled. Possibly, he could also have been paid uh, by uh, uh, by Mussolini's agent. We should not um, ignore that possibility. Um, but fortunately, uh, his remarks actually did um, uh, re did result in uh, people, uh, African American newspapers, uh, newspaper editors, uh, rallying behind Ethiopia. That also brings up the issue of how Ethiopia is viewed uh, within uh, uh, the diaspora community. You know, there is a, there is that love hate relationship. Uh, today, we obviously focused on. On, on the positive side, on the romantic side, but you also had a small group within the African American community that was very, very critical of Ethiopia uh, for various reasons. So, to a degree, uh, Garvey's writings in 1937 uh, pandered to you know to those negative images of Ethiopia: slavery, dictatorship, uh, primitive. So he was playing uh, uh, into that pre-existing image of Ethiopia. Thank you. Okay, any other from the panelists, any point that you want to raise? There, there is an, a question that is actually partially, uh, unless there is a feeling to uh, Professor Bahru, do you want it to? I'd like to make a couple of comments if, if, if there is time. <clears throat> Let me say that uh, I've been very much fascinated by all the three presentations because they, they amplify in a way what uh, I, I delivered uh, yesterday in the keynote speech. Uh, uh, the, the Back to Africa movement, a contemporary edition of Back to Africa movement by Eshion, the literary dimension of uh, uh, the African-American solidarity with Ethiopia in the, during the fascist invasion by Nadia, and Fukuro has unearthed a rather precious uh, document which has eluded me in my search for the, and the biography of uh, Malaku. Uh, because at that time I went to the Schomburg Center and I, I discovered, I was able to discover quite a few documents. So uh, I was really struck by the by the by this thing. Maybe you could say a few words about uh, how you came across it. Maybe I, I, I did not uh, follow you uh, exactly uh, correctly. Uh, how you how, how you found it? How it it got there and so on. What struck me was the contrast between uh, Dubois' relationship with Ethiopia and the Garvey's relationship, rather troubled relationship. Uh, I think Nadia has alluded to that. Not only did he falsify history by saying that Haile Selassie fled and uh, uh, Kantiwa Nasibu, Nasibu died on the battlefield, but he even went, he became an apologist for the fascist order, saying at, one, at some stage, at one stage actually, that Ethiopia uh, probably would, uh, it's probably through Italy that Ethiopia shall stretch her hands unto God, kind of realizing something that was really a, a very powerful motto for Ethiopia as well as for African Americans. So uh, uh, I'm really glad by the presentation, but maybe if you could, you could say a few, a few, a few more sure. words about the document, uh, how you came across it, where is it available now and so on. Thank you. Yes. Uh, could you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, um, so uh, that document right now, it's actually um, uh, uh, available through the University of Massachusetts, um, all Du Bois's personal papers have been uh, digitized uh, and actually they're open access. You could even Google it. But if you uh, check, say, if you were to Google under uh, Du Bois personal papers, it would take you to the University of Massachusetts database. And if one were to search uh, under Ethiopia, there would be at least over 400 results. Um, uh, so uh, you could easily, you know, search for Kentiba Gebru or Malaku Bayan, uh, and then uh, you, you know yeah, it's, it's, it's very easy to access. It's open access, uh, and there's at least there are um, about a dozen 
letters of correspondence between Du Bois and uh, and and, uh, and Bayan. Um, so there is actually much more about you know Malak Bayan that we have access to right now uh, because of that uh, database uh, uh, than we had before when uh, Professor you know Pahru was um, you know uh, uh, writing his book. So there's you know the, the information is out there. It's, 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 it's open access. Okay. Two, two questions that uh, I have on the screen. Thank you, and uh, nice to meet you again after so long. Thank you. <laughs> well, same to you, Gash uh, Bahru. But I'm not the selling. Can't take up a minute. I got a romantic slam. Hello. No, but I'm a second. Hello. Thank you. Okay. We'll see if we can translate that later on. <laughs> 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 Sorry, <laughs> I just said that when I come to Ethiopia, um, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, you know, we'll, uh, you know, uh, we'll have a lunch together. Okay, Great. thank you. So, uh, th there is one question that I've been on the screen for a while from Robel Tekliya. I feel like it was partially answered, but I will raise it here. Uh, uh, it says, Haile Selassie is still viewed and assessed differently by his Ethiopian Eritrean subject on one hand, and often romanticizing uh, black diaspora you know, on the other, what is the source of that discontent? Anybody could try to answer that. I thought partially it was with this discuss, but it would be okay to just, I feel like the, uh, still there's a lingering question there. Nadia? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I've already um, addressed what I think is the, um, the tension because I think that, as I mentioned, the ideology of Ethiopianism, which goes back from, you know, um, actually earlier than the 19th century, but 19th century is probably when it is kind of consolidated as a, as a something called Ethiopianism, um, uh, that there's some kind of um, resistance to uh, critique in, in, that's embedded in, in the ideology, I believe, so that it became difficult um, uh, to question um, uh, imperial culture because it seemed to be part and parcel of Ethiopianism. Um, and so um, even though I think that there's, I'm just repeating myself, but I think, you know, I think there is a kind of um, uh, uh, indirect sometimes um, attempt to, um, uh, you know, question and, and, and critique, but um, but it cannot really come to the surface because I think that the um, it's not uh, allowed within, um, or it's not, not um, welcomed within um, the ideology. So that was my, my view on it. Okay, one uh, question that was also, you know, on the uh, chat, uh, or the question answer is that I think it is to Fikro. To, uh, he says to drop an accusation that Gavi may have been paid by Mussolini without evidence sounds uh, problematic. Well, I said possibly. Um, well, I say that also in the context of actually what I had come across in the voice papers. Um, I have come across very strange correspondence uh, between um, some people living in Italy uh, uh, claiming to be Ethiopians uh, and corresponding with the boys. This was like around 1932. Very, very strange um, uh, 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 correspondence, uh, a, a, a series of them. So uh, my interpretation of those um, letters perhaps were uh, uh, done by some uh, Italian, uh, uh, Italian, um, uh, spies. Uh, they were trying to convince Du Bois that Ethiopia had nothing to offer to uh, uh, Black Americans, uh, but they were doing it in a very, very surreptitious, in a very clever way. So um, based on that, I would not be surprised. I, I didn't say that's what happened, but I said I wouldn't be surprised if Garvey actually was paid by, uh, by Mussolini uh, or his agents. Remember, Garvey was a Catholic too. Garvey was a Catholic. So Mussolini could have used that as a possible ground uh, for 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 um, you know for uh, uh, for tapping into Garvey's uh, uh, support for Italy. Okay, one uh, very interesting question uh, uh, actually just came up, uh, and that comes from pop culture. Uh, 
Alpha Abebe said, thanks for a great panel. Uh, if you viewed, uh, if you have viewed parts of Beyonce visual album, Black is King, you, would have, you will have seen how much she draws on antiquated and romanticized images of black and African royalty and elitism, which has sparked some interesting public debate. Are we seeing a resurgence of parochial and depoliticized representation of African past being marshaled by the wider black diaspora to counter the flood of images of black death and oppression in times of black lives matter? Any of you can take this or any of the, any other well, person? Just for the record, uh, I, I'm, I'm blind, therefore I really I have no idea what he's referring to. I've heard about it. So I defer this to either, uh, well, to my colleagues. I actually have not seen it yet, and uh, I, I've, it's been on. <laughs> it's been a plan of mine to see it, but I haven't seen it yet. Um, but it's a very interesting um, question: um, whether there is something um, uh, in the particular moment, in um, uh, as, as the question mentions, you know, to to counter the flood of um, of images of black death, that there needs to be um, a kind of um, uh, that there is a kind of desire to turn to um, uh, something uh, to restore a kind of dignity and, and um, that there that royalty in a kind of, um, as, as the question points out, like depoliticized way is um, uh, seen as somehow, um, uh, yeah, I, um, somehow restorative. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, it is, it is an interesting question. I don't really have, um, unfortunately, an informed way of answering it because I haven't seen the, the um, visual album yet. So. Um. Aishan? I, I have not seen it either. I, I do can refer you to an article uh, written by a Cornell professor of history. Um, Russell Rickford. Russell Rickford, yeah. On, in Africa on, as a country. Album. Uh, Africa is a country. Yeah. If you just say Russell Rickford, uh, you will find a good essay. And, and it's actually raised a lot of uh, uh, discussion among people. I, I just feel the question sometimes is unfair, uh, being an art historian, is that the when you talk about the literary or artistic or visual imagination, I mean, I think uh, uh, there is something about it that is. Uh, cannot be judged by these kind of political uh, uh, measurements. I mean, throughout history, even if you look at uh, the presentation here, and, and especially Nadia's references to poetry, are we going to judge uh, um, these journals by ethnographic uh, you know, accuracy? Uh, are, they, uh, um, are we going to say to artists, uh, don't, uh, you know, because now when you think about um, the kind of the, like, if you think about the postmodern condition, and if you think about, let's say, just the genre of rap and, and, and in pop culture, uh, citations, uh, mixing, uh, and all of those things became creative tools of, of, of recreation of the past in a way that is, I think, it, I just, I'm again, it's limiting the freedom of the artist in terms of how they should do things according to a specific, you know, of course, at the yardstick of ethics and, and so forth, uh, uh, and, and accuracy may play a role. But I think in, in artistic creativity, uh, we will have to allow that kind of a space that for people to be creative. And if that is an image in a museum, um, uh, it, it's, you know, you deconstruct, you mix, you select. I mean, it, it, there is a lot of things that happen in the creative process that is a uh, different and, and and in the case of Beyonce, I didn't see the whole thing, but I've seen part of it just my interest because a lot of people ask me whether that art piece <laughs> that she used as a uh, as a headdress. I mean, one of them is actually from where I came from, from Northern Sudan. Uh, and I mean, some Sudanese were really happy with it at the level of pop culture that Beyonce cited something out of ancient Sudanese. I, uh, uh, you know, item or motif, and 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 hers is a very pan-African selective, uh, um, but it's also arbitrary to some extent. And I think it, it's part of the 
recreative processes that they, of the creative process. There are like different uh, items that the mind goes into or the visually and recompose them uh, in another way, uh, in a genre that is cinema. But it's also, the, you have to remember, Beyonce is not doing this alone. There is a whole set of filmmakers and, and researchers and, 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 and fashion designers. Uh, so there's something else that, uh, there's another lens through which that we could actually judge. But I, I would love to listen to others that reflecting on this. There are several people here, Elizabeth Georges, who's a, an art historian, that now we uh, I, yeah. I just want to say, Salah, to, uh, just to add to uh, Alpha Abba's comment, uh, that was a very good uh, uh, comment that she brought up. So the same thing is happening in Ethiopia too, romanticizing. As the politics grow harsher and harsher, uh, romanticizing uh, Haile Selassie has become a new thing. Uh, so, you know, just if Teddy Afro, for example, the, the singer Teddy Afro goes back to the royalty uh, to, to, to look for a united Ethiopia, you know? So that kind of thing is happening in Ethiopia too. So I, I just wanted to endorse what, I haven't seen Beyonce's uh, thing, but I just wanted to endorse what uh, Alpha commented on. Um, yeah, I was, I was very surprised when I went to, I mean, I visited Ethiopia a couple of years ago um, my second time going there, the first time um, for the conference you organized, you know, for the, the Akalalu conference. And um, I was surprised to see on the back of, you know, so many bajajes, you see pictures of, uh, you know, Menelik or Islasi or Teodros or, you know, just there's a kind of um, resurgence of, it seems like, um, fascination with Ethiopian royalty in nostalgia. Ethiopia. So uncritical nostalgia. Mm -hmm. so it's very dangerous too. <laughs> yeah. But you also, you also have to put it in the context and within the, in the context of the larger picture, which is on the one hand to this anything Ethiopian, the culture, the food, the uh, well, there are many languages, but the Amharic language, the script. So on the one hand, there is this, I don't even know where it came from. It's very, it's, it's very atavistic. Uh, so to this anything Ethiopian. So uh, as a result of that, we have, uh, uh, we have the resurgence, we have the revival of uh, Ethiopianism within the Ethiopian context. Yeah. Okay, Salah, so, can I just quickly add? Let's see, can you turn it to volume? Um, that it's also the case that among Ethiopians in the diaspora, especially young people, in part because of the large, uh, power of reggae music, the way in which iconographies of Haile Selassie show up, t-shirts, so on and so forth, because as immigrants from a poor country in the contemporary, Haile Selassie still wields enormous amount of prestige yes. in the global stage. And again, especially via reggae music. So sometimes you see that as a way to give yourself some kind of cover as an immigrant, quite often hailed through images of hunger and so on and so forth. So that romanticized notion is in Ethiopia, is in the diaspora. It's also among Ethiopians in the diaspora in the world. I just I have one more chance for one comment or a question and then we end it. We are supposed, we have gone over time. So now just a disclaimer from uh, Fuad Maki, the question regarding Garvey, for some reason appeared under my name, but it's not from me, okay? <laughs> there must be a technical glitch of some sort. Okay, okay. thank you so much, Quiet. I mean, I thought, uh, I, I, I edited it. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm glad that I edited that part. It, it, it doesn't say it sounds strange, but it sounds like Trumpian. So <laughs> I, I, I took that part out. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, let me just end it here. Uh, and I really want to thank you all, uh, Nadia, Aishin, and Tikre, for really very inspiring and enlightening uh, uh, presentations. And also the discussion and all the colleagues that uh, kind of interjected or intervened and gave comments. And I think uh, um, that would be great. We actually, at some point, just going back to Beyonce and pop culture, is that we are trying to do a panel soon as part of our uh, 
on the idea of cultural appropriation in general. And uh, so we may have somebody who can talk about this specifically as in one example, and, but among other issues. Uh, uh, that is how cultural appropriation, especially cultural appropriation of black, of black uh, culture in general, like, uh, sorry, appropriation of black culture. So thank you so much. Uh, we'll now, I just wanna ask everybody who's a panelist to leave the panel, but actually join through the special, uh, uh, and this is also goes for the attendee. For the next session, you have to join through another uh, 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 link that we've sent you. So there's a link for each panel, but for participant and panelists, we've sent you a special link so you, you, can, you can intervene and talk and also appear within the panel system, okay? Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.